Welcome to Color Code, a podcast about race in Canada by the Globe and Mail. I'm Hannah Sung. And I'm Denise Balkasun. Today's episode is about race and real estate in Vancouver. Yeah, we said it. Race and real estate. Two topics that many people and politicians are doing their best to keep very separate. There's a history to Vancouver, a very specific history. And we're not saying we want to link race with the current real estate situation, which is very complicated. But jacked up housing prices don't come out of nowhere. Anti-Chinese rhetoric also has long lineage in BC. So it's worth trying to discuss when, where, and how race and real estate intersect. And maybe we'll be able to suss out whether there are lessons for the rest of Canada, especially in places where we talk about housing markets and foreign buyers in the same breath. But to start, We're mainly focusing on Vancouver. Now, the real estate market is very complicated, and this podcast is by no means a primer on housing, but there are a few facts you need to know to get the show on the road. 2.87 million dollars. That was the average price of a detached house in the city of Vancouver, according to data in January of this year. The average price had gone up 46% in one year. Affordable housing is in crisis in Vancouver. The vacancy rate for rental properties is almost zero. Say you're a young person or family wanting to become first-time buyers in this region. To afford the minimum down payment on a typical home, you'd have to save 10% of your pre-tax income for 11 years. In the meantime, everyone in Vancouver has heard stories of people giving up on ever owning a home. They're just leaving to live elsewhere. There's a real lack of data, but the province of BC did track housing transactions for 20 days in June. That's almost three weeks. That data showed 5% of Metro Vancouver real estate transactions were made by foreign buyers during those 20 days, 90% of whom are originally from China. On average, foreign buyers spent about $400,000 more than Canadians in these transactions. That data was released to the public, and then, a few weeks later, A new 15% foreign buyer's tax was implemented. The tax happened so fast, it caught people by surprise. That doesn't mean it wasn't popular. Right after the foreign buyer's tax was introduced, polls showed that 90% of Vancouverites supported it, even though almost half of respondents believed it wouldn't be effective in cooling the market. All the while, as the price of residential properties soar, rent does too, homelessness is going up, and yeah, everyone is feeling squeezed. So the real estate situation is complicated in Vancouver. Over the past year, the Globe and Mail has done investigations on shadow flipping, loopholes, a perceived lack of government data and intervention on all levels, and then there's the fundamental question of whether a home is a home or an investment. But what we're focusing on today is what's been called the quote-unquote dragon in the room. We're going to talk about the race elements of this broad conversation about housing in Vancouver. And I started by making a call. I unabashedly love my city. I am such a cheerleader for it that it can be embarrassing. This is Claudia Kwan. She's Canadian-born Chinese and was born and raised in Vancouver. I think aside from all the numbers and the data is the feeling. People feel desperate. People feel cornered, thinking that they're never going to be able to get into the property market. They're feeling scared about the future. Claudia is a reporter who covers real estate, which is a very hot topic for Vancouver media. They always say you're not supposed to read the comments online. I always read the comments online because I think there can be some measure of honesty that emerges from the anonymity of a keyboard. Uh, it, It doesn't take a lot of reading before you notice that there is definitely a racial tone in many of the comments that are made. I asked Claudia about racial comments in real life. It's not uncommon to see incidents of casual racism where, you know, um, there's a roll of the eyes if somebody has an accent. Is that a class issue versus a race issue? I'm not sure. Is there an example you can think of where you saw someone being treated horribly because they had an accent? Oh, I've been given the stink eye for speaking Cantonese in public. I've been told... You should, this is Canada, you should be speaking English. I mean... Wait, wait. Somebody said that to you? Oh, all the time. Like, where? Like, in, in public? I like, was, on the street? Oh, my gosh, on the bus. 
I mean, the I was, yeah, there was a, there was a, a Cantonese speaking senior who just wanted to make sure, um, you know, that they were going where they needed to be. I stepped in to translate because I have that capacity. And then, you know, another passenger on the bus spoke up. I mean, there's, there's, there's racist incidents all the time. I've been physically threatened before. You've been threatened? Yep. You you haven't? I, I mean, I, I, I'm not being jocular, but you, you haven't had racial comments directed at you ever? Well, you know, the last racial comment I had directed at me, which was pretty aggressive. It wasn't a threat, but it was aggressive. And it was when I was in BC. Mm. You know, a woman said to me, go back home to China in a very right. angry way. And I know that these things are random, mm -hmm. you know, and they're randomly racist people everywhere, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was in it was in Surrey, BC, and I remember thinking, why, why? You know, this conversation can turn corrosive around, you know, who belongs here and who doesn't. So that was Claudia Kwan, and uh, after that phone call, you know, offline, I did meet up with her, and she is the best Vancouver tour guide. So just in case you get the wrong impression, she does love Vancouver. She's just a realist when it comes to sensing racial tensions, and I appreciate that point of view because she's, she, she's actually there, you know. I've been to Vancouver twice, and even before real estate across Canada started going bananas, um, both times that I was in Vancouver, I found it a very segregated place. So I wouldn't say that I found it overtly racist, but I did find that it was, you know, people of South Asian descent hung out in one area and um, white people hung out in one area and Asian people hung out in one area. And so um, it didn't mean anyone disliked each other, but there was a lot of self-segregation that I sensed. That's very interesting. And uh, I go at least once a year because I have family in Vancouver. Um, the one thing that I know just from my small, tiny personal experience is that investment properties is a thing, you know, and it's not about your skin color, but it's about are you rich enough to be a landlord? And um, people are obsessed with talking about real estate, no matter which side of the coin you're on, whether you're renting or wanting to buy or you have tenants. You know, um, conversation just always circles back to real estate. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say by now, episode nine of Color Code, that we know that there is a history of racist immigration policy in Canada, but there's a specificity to the anti-Asian and anti-Chinese policy in BC. Um, first of all, I mean, there's a list, right? So Canada had a head tax, which the government did apologize for in 2006. There was also the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which went from the time of the head tax through to 1947, which effectively barred people coming from China to Canada. There's also the history of the Asiatic Exclusion League and its role in the anti-Asian riot in Vancouver in 1907, during which people went on a violent spree in Vancouver's Chinatown. And if you didn't already know about the Asiatic Exclusion League or the anti-Asian riot, we'll put it in our show notes so that you can find out more. So we know from these historical events and policies that Chinese people haven't always been welcome on the Pacific coast of Canada. And to try and understand how that history intersects with the history of Vancouver real estate, we've got UBC professor Henry Yu. You know, the Chinese were among the first non-Indigenous peoples to come here. They did things like mining, fishing, and you could say that they really didn't change in terms of their, um, their place here until they helped build the railroad, which then led to a lot of European migrants coming. And you could say that they looked around, people getting off the train, said, what are all these natives and Chinese doing here? In, in essence, in 1885, you started to get the rise of white supremacy as a political tool. You know, I used to term white supremacy and people often go, oh my gosh, are you talking about Nazis? Well we had a form of white supremacy here. So a couple key things. One is removing indigenous peoples from their land and you know, basically putting them into reserves on bad real estate so that the good real estate could be used you know, by the new settlers. The second was 
looking around and seeing all these Chinese who are already here, disenfranchising them. So in 1871, you know, with the uh, establishment of, of British Columbia as part of this new dominion of Canada, Chinese who had the vote is taken away. And what that allows is to think of this new Canadian society, this new Canada as being a white man's country. And that's in some sense the, the long history of anti-Chinese uh, rhetoric as being foreign, not belonging here, coming late, right? as if they're coming late to take away what naturally belongs to white Canadians. What you got in places like Shaughnessy was by the 1920s, as part of the speculative real estate market, was to create these you know, reserved places for elite whites. You have housing covenants, where when you buy it, you have to sign something that says you won't sell to Chinese, to natives, to blacks, to Jews. And those many land titles for you know, uh, houses in places like Shaughnessy and, and Carisdale and British properties still have those covenants. You know? So there's a kind of racial order created that actually shapes the geography of the city. When Hong Kong Chinese started to come with money in the 1990s, this reaction of people like, oh, they're taking over. People saying, Hong Hoover, and oh, this is terrible. These people are moving into our neighborhood. It's not a surprise that there was this reaction. The actually surprising thing is how short-lived that reaction was. Within really five, 10 years, it had dissipated. So one of the interesting things about that period of time was how people like Lieutenant Governor David Lamb, who had been a, you know, a developer himself, he, he really went around to, to other you know, Hong Kong Chinese and said, look, we've got to give back. We've got to, do, we've got to have philanthropy in a high profile way. We have to really prove that we're not here to threaten or take away. Um, I think one of the differences you could say right now in the last 10 years, as more and more people come from mainland China, China is that um, perhaps that kind of you know overt attempt to to mitigate the anti-Chinese uh, racism that's being uh, shown has not been you know as as evident. Now that's not to blame the victim, saying oh you know if there's people being racist against you, you should build hospital wings and and things like that. But in fact, that was one of the things that happened in the 90s is that uh, the Hong Kong Chinese who did have you know, wealth, spread it around. A lot of the people have come, they've benefited from the economic reforms and the expansion of the Chinese economy. So are they uh, savvy, you know, business people, some of them, and very entrepreneurial? You bet, you know. Um, are they also kind of acting in sort of the way in which nouveau riche have acted since the 19th century of buying lots of high status goods and showing them off. Yeah, but guess what? That's what 19th century Americans did too. And that's what 19th century British did too. And that's what the new rich of the United States also do, those Wall Street guys, that 1%. Um, so the inequities in class of capitalism get expressed in all kinds of ways in terms of resentment. What's interesting is how those resentments get racialized in particular ways in places like Vancouver. So I found that history lesson very interesting and something that made my ears perk up um, was when he talked about how the geography of the city has been shaped by uh, by these housing covenants that I didn't know about before that restricted the sale of homes to Asians or people from Asian or African descent, Jews as well. And people have found housing covenants in their land deed titles and, you know, from like, say, the 1940s. That isn't very long ago. no. It's, it's amazing how something from 50 or 100 years ago can still direct people's relationships today, I guess, mm -hmm. even if it's not held up legally, it just sort of perpetuates socially. Well, some of those neighborhoods that did have those housing covenants in place, um, Shaughnessy, Carisdale, British properties are the ones that, Henry, you mentioned. Well, those are the areas with the fancy homes, right? And so it's that idea of encroachment of people from outside who are not white, who have 
money buying those homes that were up until just a couple of generations ago completely restricted to them. Mm-hmm. No wonder there's a sense of tension there. Right. I think it's interesting that Henry Yu points out that perhaps the nouveau riche of mainland China are behaving in an ostentatious manner. Because this is something that interests me in terms of when I think about climate change. And we talk about how everyone in China and India wants a car now and they never had one. And they don't, don't they know it's bad for the climate? And it's like, well, North America has known it's bad for the climate for at least most of my lifetime. And so, no, I don't want everyone in India and China to buy a car. However, we don't really have a moral leg to stand on there for like, don't you guys know that's bad? And so, um, like who gets to act rich? Yeah. Who gets to have a car? Who gets to drive around? Who gets to throw their money around? I mean, I think that there's a definite like prurient interest. How do you say that word? <laughs> there's a definite interest in quote unquote foreign money when you look at shows like Ultra Rich Asian Girls because the idea of nouveau riche now is racialized. I mean, Canada is a country that tried through immigration laws to stay white. And since things changed with the introduction of multiculturalism in the late 60s, previously poor countries have had their economies roar to life. And now that class difference is racialized and, of course, globalized. Another thing that I thought is really interesting in some of the Globe coverage is how, and Henry Yu brings this up as well, is how different generations of Chinese immigrants to Canada interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you read Crazy Rich Asians? Oh, yeah, I did. That was a long time ago. (laughs) Um, So there's a lot of that in there, too, where the the old Hong Kong rich or the old Singapore rich really look down on the mainland Chinese. It's interesting to see that play out in Vancouver. So he says when the post-handover generation of Hong Kong immigrants came, they were sort of more or less embraced by the Chinese people who were already in Vancouver. But this generation is being held at arm's length, and that interplays with the tensions that are happening in part because of real estate. Mm -hmm. And what is that? I mean, is it a cultural difference or is it like that money can really separate and divide people, you know? I think it's a bit of both. The story that Frances Beulah did for The Globe in August, she spoke about how, you know, immigrants from Hong Kong speak good English. You know, English is a language that they learned alongside whichever Chinese dialect they learn. And they often went to a British school system that's more familiar to Canadians. And so I think, um, I mean, that's the interesting thing part, right, is that when you say, oh, someone is racist against Chinese people or people who seem to be Chinese, even that sort of prejudice is so ignorant of the many divisions and classes and cultures within this large group of people that we call Chinese. Mm -hmm. It isn't one monolith. Yeah. And, you know, that also speaks to the idea of assimilation. Like when you say that Hong Kong Chinese were raised in a British school system, the idea of assimilation that we visited last week Mm -hmm. with our eggshells episode. I mean, uh, how much do you demand that people be just like you in order to have entry into your country when really our kind of idea of multiculturalism and the point system is about economic growth and strength of the country? You know, how much are you going to demand that people act like you and speak like you when what you want are their skills? Mm -hmm. And their dollars. Yeah. And so in the Frances Bula story from August, she mentions, so she interviews a lot of newcomers from mainland China who were very successful um, in businesses there and decided to use that wealth to move to Canada. And this is something that they expressed to her, which is, you know, it's very unfair to say, yes, someone can come to this country and can pay the $120,000 that we ask investor immigrants to pay, and then for them to be met with prejudice when they get here, when they're everything that they're doing is allowed legally by the government. And so there was sort of this feeling of hurt, I guess, on some Mm -hmm. of her interviewees, which is that, you know, we haven't done anything that you said was wrong. We haven't broken any laws. So the feeling from some of the interviewees in Francis's piece was that this is just really unfair. Mm -hmm. Well, every year now, I do visit Vancouver for a family vacation. And I was there in August. And while I was there, I happened to hear this news story. 
Now, could it be a sign of the growing tension in the real estate market? More than two dozen signs belonging to one realtor have been vandalized. Our John Daly is live in Vancouver with more on this. And John, at least one suspect was caught on camera. Tell us about that. Yes, Sophie, it's been going on for months now. Now, realtor Melissa Wu's signs either completely stolen or vandalized. Her Chinese name, which was here, completely cut out. Now, obviously, this sign has been repaired, but with the, her Chinese name being cut out, it raises is the issue of whether or not this might be racist. Now, I was in Vancouver when I saw this story, so I decided to go find Melissa Wu. She gave me an address to a $4.5 million home in the west side. Hi, are you Melissa? Yes, I am. Hi, I'm Hannah from Hi, the Anna. Global Mail, Hannah Hi, side. Anna. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So tell me about this home. Is this a home that you have listed? Yes. Mm -hmm. I've listed this home about uh, six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ever since I had the for sale sign up here, um, there's one person that keeps taking it down. Yeah, and we saw the person actually carved out my Chinese name and threw the sign on the floor. So how many times then, just in this one location, has your sign been taken down or defaced? Mm -hmm. This location seven times. Yeah. What do you think about that? It's, it's just very disturbing, especially recently when I saw that it was my Chinese name that was being targeted. Can you um, show me what the signage looks like here? Okay, so, so now I mean, like, this, is like, this is like constructed out yeah. of wood. So this, but this part here, it's kind of plastic. So what he did was he carved out this one. Like, this one was cut up. Like, this Chinese name was cut out. Oh, he, he cut out just your Chinese name. Yeah. Right? That's There's so much information going on in this sign, and that's just the one part in Chinese characters, and he took it out. And that's in all three locations. The same thing happened. Wow. Having seen this, it really, like, sad. It makes me sad. Like, as a Vancouver right, you know, if it's racially motivated, it's just very disturbing. So it was very disturbing. Yeah, it's creepy. It's so precise. Yes. Like the camera that caught this man uh, in action, you, you see him with a box cutter and it's very systematic and it takes considerable effort to cut out her Chinese name from the sign because it's quite thick and heavy plastic. And, you know, just the fact that it's only her Chinese name in all the signs, multiple times, in many locations. Like what's interesting about the news report, which is what I initially saw, is that, you know, it's a question. Is this a sign of growing racial tension? Is there racial tension? I mean, sure, maybe there isn't any one definitive answer because that's the nature of racial tension. Not everybody feels the same way, but I mean, I think it's pretty clear what's right. happening here, you yeah. know, but that that's always the mode is questioning. And, uh, you know, what 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 is the answer? I mean, yes, like basically what the answer is is that here's this woman who shows homes. She'll, she's a professional, but she, she shows up on her own, right? If you're a realtor, you go around on your own to all these houses and you're meeting strangers. I mean, the level of fear you'd have for your physical security. She told me she had her brother going around with her now, and um, they also had someone just kind of parked across the street always watching. Um, Aside from being scary, that's infuriating to me. Mm-hmm. Why you need that kind of security to do your job. Mm -hmm. It is just so hard to have a discussion about racism where people say, yes, that was racist. Unless it's like like the five slurs that we've all accepted are racial slurs are like spray painted on a religious building. Anything beyond that, there always seems to be like, maybe, I don't know, it's so vague. The reluctance or refusal to name it. I mean, maybe this gets back to our Canada versus USA episode, The Angel Complex, where racism in Canada tends to be so much more subtle and harder to name and slippery. And maybe this is just an example of that. Yeah, I think it's also an example of whether people collectively want to speak together against this type of action or whether people are just too afraid and just don't want to get into it at all whatsoever. If you keep that big door open to like that level of doubt, maybe she had a personal beef with someone. Maybe she has a competitor. You know, mm -hmm. although all those maybes are ridiculous because they don't exclude racism. If it's her competitor, her competitor is doing a racist act. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you were reporting the story already when you were there. Did seeing the sort of concrete, physical act happen while you were reporting make you feel or think any differently about it? You know, for me, her fear was palpable and her disappointment that she had to be at the center of this kind of an incident. And I really felt for her. So I I met her on the sidewalk in front of her listing uh, where that sign had, you know, one of the many signs had been defaced. And I left her as she's waiting for the police. So she had reported it. Good for her. She had gotten the media attention. Again, very good for a public discussion. But I walked away feeling really sad and kind of apprehensive. Like, now what? Now what's going to happen, you know? And what tools do the police have to deal with this kind of a situation? I mean, one way of looking at it is just some guy ruined a sign. Mm -hmm. Another way of looking at it is that it's a hate crime because it it fills a community with fear. Mm -hmm. What's the way that the one responding police officer is going to, you know, assess the situation? Mm -hmm. So... Do you know what happened to Melissa after this? Well, I just had a little text conversation with her this past week, and she said that ultimately the police told her that this man has mental health issues and that there's nothing that can be done. So that's how the situation ends for her, is that nothing gets resolved. Right. Vancouver, it's so strange here. I mean, the market is just, it's like a soup of so many different factors. Yeah. First of all, it's a hot pot. It's a hot pot, <laughs> right? It's a hot pot that everybody has to eat from, but yet somebody has not used the right chopsticks. After I met up with Melissa Wu, I went to meet someone I'd been wanting to talk to for a long time. You know, it's how that hot, how that hot pot is. <laughs> it always comes down to food. It's, it's distributed. Andy Yan is an urban planner and an academic, and he is deeply into data. He led a case study in 2015 that really sparked controversy in Vancouver. He looked at buyers in a few key neighborhoods over a six-month period and analyzed the names. So there are different waves of immigration from China, as Henry Yu pointed out. And depending on how names are anglicized, it can denote the era during which people came to Canada. So according to Andy's data... 66% of buyers from his study were likely recent arrivals from mainland China. But he also found that 82% of all the buyers needed a mortgage, which directly pokes holes in the notion that wealthy Chinese people arrive with tons of money, injecting it directly into the market. The big takeaway for Andy was that what was happening was actually a complex interplay between global money and Canadian lending institutions. But what other people saw as a takeaway was that analyzing names in this way was racist. Mayor Gregor Robertson famously said this can't be about race, which is true. It shouldn't be. But Andy is all about data, and he used the kind of methodology that he says is common in academia. So we met up to talk, and I should mention that this conversation happened in August, right after the foreign buyer's tax was introduced. I met up with Andy Yan in his neighborhood, which is called Hastings Sunrise. Hi. Yes. <laughs> so this is this is one of my haunts. Uh-huh. This famous, is your neighborhood then? This is my neighborhood. Here we are on a lovely residential street in Hastings Sunrise. And, uh, you know, these are nice homes, but they're not in any way ostentatious or fancy. Like, how much would a house around here go for? Over a million dollars. But, you know, I'm looking at bungalows. They're quite modest. And I think that's precisely one of the biggest challenges is the idea of a million dollar home in Vancouver was actually quite rare. In 2006, about 20%, when you correct for inflation, of Vancouver homes were over a million dollars. If you bring it to 2016, it becomes 91% of single family homes in the city of Vancouver becomes over a million dollars. This neighborhood was really where so many built their Canadian dreams, those who were born here and those who migrated here. And I think moving forward, that dream is challenged. It's, It's under severe pressure. Residential real estate in Vancouver, part of it, some parts of it, is entering a global economy. So you're saying that if I wanted to buy a home in Vancouver, I'm not competing against somebody else in my kind of income bracket from the next neighborhood over, but I'm competing with people across the Pacific Ocean for this house that I want to buy. 
I think that's in part. That's certainly in, that's actually in certain neighborhoods. It's also, I think, moving, not only talking about a residential real estate market that is becoming increasingly globalized, it's really talking about how local residential real estate prices and rents, I should add, are being decoupled from local incomes and wages. And I think that that has brought in remarkable strains in Vancouver in terms of really the idea that if you work in this city, why can't you afford to live in it? Mm -hmm. So that affordability question, like why can't I afford to live in the city where I work? Mm -hmm. Seems like for a lot of people, the answer they come to is foreign buyers. Well, I think that that's one of the issues, and I think that's currently being, I think, explored. But then I think really the bigger conversation are homes that are really investments, that are not resident occupied. That whether that person is a foreigner or a, or somebody who is who is Canadian, either by um, by birth or by citizenship, really highlights one of the biggest challenges in Vancouver is what is the notion of a home. Mm -hmm. Is it a fundamental human right? Is it a investment? Understanding the problem you want to deal with before looking for the solution, mm -hmm. I think that that is a fundamental key question here is problem definition. Mm -hmm. Have you actually gotten to the core of the problem? Are you focused upon not the symptom, but the cause of what you're trying to address? I, and, I, and I think this is important to actually realize that um, there, there was actually a group of economists and scholars at both University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University uh, who actually talked about a BC affordable housing fund. And it was, it, it actually was quite considered in terms of how do we meet the housing challenges in Vancouver and, and British Columbia in general. The academics of, of Vancouver stepped up and came out with that recommendation. Now the issue at hand is whether the leadership wants to listen to it. Or political leadership? I think in, in particular the political leadership. And it is a fundamental foundation and question of leadership of how do you deal with this concern, this frustration, and I think ultimately anger. And I think that it's looking at the roots of that anger, it's fear. And leaders, I think the leaders we need on a local, provincial, and federal level is one that can deal with fear and uncertainty. So are people angry with, the, with all different levels of government, or are people angry with rich people who are coming over? I think they're angry on indifference, on the feeling that their leaders are indifferent and incapable of acting on the arena of real estate and housing. Just to remind you, the point of this podcast is to discuss race and many different stories of race and just kind of try to unpack what our own identities are as Canadians and, and, and talk about the stuff that doesn't get aired out very much. So specific to the Vancouver um, real estate market, <laughs> why are you laughing? Does, does Vancouver have a race problem? Does Vancouver have a race problem? That's an interesting question. I think with that conversation and being Canadian, it's time to get uncomfortable. It is not a comforting conversation because it's a moment not for shouting but for introspection. This city, Vancouver, was founded on the ashes of a genocide. It was built upon a foundation of cultural genocides of First Nations. Let's begin off right there. Let's begin from that fact and that from that fact it isn't dwelling in the past, it's the question of how we move forward. What I've realized in some of my work in the United States is actually the need to listen and to reach out. Like specifically ask people that you think would have a unique point of view? Go to where the people are. Yeah. That there was one meeting, one public meeting on, redevel on redevelopment, on re uh, regeneration in the neighborhood in, Lo in Los Angeles I was at. The first thing we did was actually go into the church, say, please come to the meeting in Spanish. 
not me, but somebody from the community. If there, if more listening needs to happen in Vancouver, you know, what is your Spanish language church? Like, what is your place that you need to go to to get that perspective? It's a good question. <laughs> what is that? What is what is that perspective? It is talking to the polyglot of multi-ethnic media, of, of, of non-English media that actually occurs in Vancouver. It is actually having the ability to have a diverse staff who speaks a multitude of languages to reach out because you're, not, you're never necessarily sure what you might get when you actually begin to listen. You ground truth it. That that's a principle that I actually push hard to my planning students is that you need to ground truth things. What does that mean? It means that governments have statistics, they have maps through which may not necessarily reflect the truths on the ground. It's talking about how we move from a kind of sectarian village into a diverse metropolis. Is Vancouver a sectarian village? I think that's a key question. What do you think? What do I think is a sectarian village? I think that we're, in one way, it's moving from the idea of a village of clubhouses in towards that greater metropolis that is diverse, that is inclusive. And I think that that is a huge challenge moving ahead because it's really easy to hang out with your tribe but yet it's reaching out to the other tribes of the city in towards building that nation, building that city that is really hard to do. So if you haven't noticed by now, Andy Yan is a professor and he talks like one. Andy is filled with ideas and he's deep. And what he said next is a master class in what leaders need to understand in order to be smarter about cities. One of the things I teach at the university is social capital talking about bonding and bridging. Bonding social capital is really how you keep the group together. Bridging social capital is a lot more tricky. It actually means you connect to people who aren't necessarily like yourself. From what little I know about this kind of world, academically speaking, it seems like class would be one of the most um, tough barriers. Well, in the academy, it's called intersectionality. Yeah. Intersectionality is the is, is the one ring that rules all. And the kind of complexities in navigating race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, and how one can be many things at once is the challenge of a 21st century Canada. And it doesn't matter if you're the Prime Minister of Canada or the Mayor of Vancouver or even that neighborhood block captain, that how you deal with the issue of intersectionality, I think, will, de will determine your success as a leader. Andy is critical of leadership, and he knows Vancouver's imperfect history. But yet, I'm also optimistic. I mean, Canada is an experiment through which right now we're looking pretty good. And I'd like to see it go keep on that way. Yeah. And I think that in that extent, it isn't to be complicit with the past or bounded by the past, but it's looking towards those future horizons. It is being daring. It is being considered that I think will ultimately determine our success as a city. Mm -hmm. Leadership. Andy Ann is critical of <laughs> leadership or lack thereof. Well, I think it's interesting that he brought up intersectionality um, as crucial for a leader to understand. Uh, it echoes Robin D'Angelo, who we had on last week. Totally. Um, just Andy Yen is reading his Robin D'Angelo, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> well, I think it's just it's just true. Like in the modern world, there's no just saying, oh, here's this imaginary control group person that we will design things for, and then everyone else will just sort of go along with it. Like, that just doesn't, doesn't fly anymore. Yeah, the real world is messier, and, uh, and the ground truth thing, I've never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was very interesting, just the complete chasm between the bureaucracy and that bureaucratic understanding of populations and geography versus the real, on-the-ground, lived experience. 
And people like Andy Ann try to bridge that that chasm, but um, obviously he doesn't think that a, a, an adequate job is being done, really. I really loved when he said sectarian village because that was such a strong phrase to use when you characterize a Canadian city. Mm-hmm. Really, my main takeaway from my conversation with Andy Ann is how quickly Vancouver is going through some major growing pains. It's like they're on the forefront of like maybe what the rest of Canada, at least when it comes to big cities, will be experiencing. And, you know, the global and the local colliding and really leadership being unprepared and not understanding how to guide, you know, through policy, how to guide a city through that kind of inevitability. And so speaking of growing pains, you earlier in the episode, you had mentioned the anti-Asian riots in Vancouver in 1907. And that happened after a period of really rapid growth. Chinese workers had finished the railroad in 1885. And so they had turned to other jobs in other industries. And that created competition with white workers. There's a lot of tension there. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that rapid change can make people anxious and fearful. And sometimes they express that as prejudice. And so that brings us back to Andy Yan. And what he said about intersectionality is so interesting to me. Because on one hand, the mayor's saying, this isn't about race. Mm-hmm. So the mayor is obviously reluctant to deal with race. And for me, a lot of that is because there's this vacuum where we don't learn about racist policies of the past. And so that is not something that's sort of discussed and worked out by the time we're like, 26 and hoping to maybe own a property one day. And so for someone who starts thinking about this, it all comes at once. It's like, here's this history and here's why Vancouver may be, you know, a collection of sectarian villages. And how does that interplay with the fact that I can't save 10% of my income for 11 years while also paying rent and, you know, paying off my student loans and maybe having a child? Like all of that happens at once. And that to me is intersectionality writ large. Mm -hmm. Um, And so how, I don't know who the leader would be who was like, okay, so we have our past to deal with. And P.S., what about Indigenous treaties? And meanwhile, what about affordable housing, right? Because all of this has a lot to do with home ownership. Um, But home ownership and affordable housing are not actually synonyms. And within the Canadian dream, quote unquote, they often, the only idea of affordable housing is home ownership. And it's just not the same thing. We should probably mention that uh, the popularity of the foreign buyers tax has actually gone down with time. So immediately after it was announced, uh, 90% of respondents were into it. Mm -hmm. Since then, there was another poll a month later that showed it was three quarters. Um, So some different numbers there, but definitely, you know, a definite majority Mm -hmm. of Vancouverites uh, support the idea of a foreign buyer's tax. We should also say that Christy Clark, the B.C. premier, her popularity has gone up um, since since the foreign buyer's tax was introduced and um, election time, you know, in the spring. What do you think the takeaway is for Vancouver and race and real estate? Well, I just really, really think what Vancouver is going through now is um, a sign of what the rest of us could go through um, very soon. And I also think that if you're just sweeping the stuff under the rug all the time because you don't want to talk about, quote unquote, foreigners, if you don't want to make it about race, well, then you get weird explosions of anger that gets funneled through a lens of racism, you know, and you get Claudia Kwan being accosted on the bus. You get Melissa Wu and her signs being defaced. You get me being told to go back to China when I'm visiting D.C. last year. You know, like, I want to be careful to not label Vancouver in any one way. But when there is a tension that is very clear and when there are emotions, so many emotions attached and really a lack of data where that emotion can just bubble up and through that lack of data then you're going to have, like, incidents, you know? So our takeaway is don't sweep it under the rug. Yes. It's pretty simple, really. Thanks for listening. This week's episode was produced by us, Hannah Sung and Denise Balkasun, and reporter Ian Marlowe did our interview with Henry Yu. Thanks to Ian for that. 
Our technical producer is Timothy Moore, and senior producer is Kevin Sue. Big thanks to our interview subjects and experts, urban planner Andy Yan, real estate reporter Claudia Kwan, UBC professor Henry Yu, and realtor Melissa Wu. Also, big thanks to our colleagues Mike Hager and Brent Jang for answering endless emails as we tried to make sense of real estate in Vancouver. And thank you to Global News for usage of the news clip about Melissa Wu. If you enjoyed this episode of Color Code, rate and review it on iTunes, share it with a friend, and tell us what you think. Take your phone and record a voice memo to tell us your own Vancouver real estate stories. Talk to us at colorcode at globamail.com. Our theme song is by Bonjay. You can find them at bonjay.net. Keep the conversation going. You can look us up on Twitter. I'm at Balkasoon. And I'm at Hannah Sung. Thanks so much for listening to Color Code.